some there will be some um math in this presentation uh, i i if you are fam you know confident and familiar with math you can follow the the actual math but uh, as i go through the math i uh, ask you to focus mostly on the concepts and not on the on the mathematics even if you don't understand what the symbols means um just uh try to listen to my words and what i how i explain what the individual terms are uh because that's i think it's important to understand um how the eddy covariance method derives from basic physics okay so but let's start from the very very basic uh what is a flux right so eddy covariance is a flux measurement technique so what is a flux to start with well in general a flux is how much of an entity of anything can be uh, a gas can be a particular matter can be energy any entity how much of that entity moves through a surface per certain amount of time okay uh, so that's the definition of a flux and so if we uh, focus it on for example co2 which is the gas i'm going to use as an example through the presentation but really it applies to any gas really uh so for co2 that would be uh, for example how much of co2 so that could be measured for example in moles or in grams uh per unit of area, so for example, per square meter, or it could be per square kilometer or per hectare, uh, per second. Mm -hmm. So you can see it here, if you can see my mouse here, okay. So moles of CO2 per square meter per second, so per, per surface per time, okay? And that's our definition of a flux, so very, very basic. Now, in particular, with the covariance, we are um, focused, or we are focusing on the uh, vertical flux of matter and energy between the surface, which can be, for example, a crop field, like in this picture, and the atmosphere. So the vertical flux is across a horizontal surface. So we imagine an horizontal surface, and we uh, think of the uh, CO2 moving up and down, and that would be our flux. Now there will be a flux upwards and a flux uh, downwards, the net of that will be our uh, the flux that we measure with the decovariance. So really, at the fundamental level, what we are trying to do with the decovariance is to to um, quantify how the turbulence in the atmosphere, so the, the movement of the air in the atmosphere, is transporting uh, CO2, and again, CO2 is a proxy for anything else, uh, from the surface to the atmosphere, up, up in the free air or vice versa from the uh, from the atmosphere to the surface. So in this example here, you can see if this uh, uh, dotted line is our imaginary uh, horizontal plane, right? Uh, imagine that there is, for example, uh, photosynthesis going on um, at this site, okay? So it's daytime, there's a, a grassland, this uh, uptaking CO2. I don't know anything about uh, biology, but I don't know stuff about the atmosphere. So don't, forgive me if I use wrong term terminology, but that's simple enough. Um, we have uh, plants up, uh, taking uh, CO2 for, uh, for photosynthesis. What happens in that case is that there will be, because the plants are taking CO2, there will be less CO2 uh, close to the surface than there is uh, up in the free air, uh, so more distant from the surface. Now, the air comes about and the turbulence and the movements, the eddies, right? So these uh, rolling motions of the air will tend to bring air up and down. And with it, it will tend to uh, transport the CO2. Now, because there is more CO2 above than below, on average, there will be more molecules of CO2 going down than going up, okay? So um, just because there, are, there is a gradient of CO2, there is, there is more CO2 up here than down here. And so the air, again, will transport the CO2 in a differential manner up and down. Uh, now, if you imagine that uh, for a moment that the uh, photosynthesis stops, okay? So there is no more uptake of CO2 from, by the plants, this uh, movement of air up and down will eventually tend to eliminate the gradient, okay, to, to, to cancel the gradient in such a way that at the end, there will be an equilibrium with as much CO2 above than below 
the this imaginary line okay because again the, as long as there is more co2 here it will tend to go down and so eventually there will be as much going up and, and as much going down and so the net flux will be zero okay if photosynthesis stops so that's really with that covariance what we want to do is to uh, follow the co2 going up and down and as this is done or is this caused by the wind the vertical wind going up and down okay so we have two important things co2 to measure and the wind going up and down okay okay now back to our uh, basic definitions terminology um when we want to quantify how much co2 is in the atmosphere we can do that for example uh, by specifying a density so density would be uh, grams or moles of CO2 per cubic meter, so per volume. Mm -hmm. While another expression of the same could be a mole fraction or, or a dry mole fraction that would be moles of grams of CO2 per mole of air. Mm -hmm. Instead of per volume, that's per mole of air. And that air can or cannot include water, and that's why we call about mole fraction or dry mole fraction if we refer the CO2 to the dry air. Um, and this dry mole fraction, we can call, we also call it the mixing ratio. Now, these are different ways of expressing how much CO2 is in the air. It doesn't tell us anything where the CO2 is going. It's just how much there is in a certain space or in a certain unit of air, okay? Now, the flux instead, as I said before, uh, because it's the amount of CO2 that is moving, across the surface, we specified in terms of per, uh, that amount of CO2 per square meter per second, or, or depending on the what we are talking about, maybe we're talking about the annual amount, so we want to refer it to, to a year or to a day uh, per square meter, per square kilometer, um, as I said before, it really depends on, on the magnitude of the number we're talking about. That goes for CO2, it goes for water, for methane, or for any other gas. Uh, we also measure, we can measure with the covariance also the, the uh, flux of energy. Uh, now, the flux of energy is again the units of energy, so that would be uh, joule uh, per square meter per second. Same thing is how much energy is going across that surface per amount of time. And so, <clears throat> joule per square meter, uh, per joule per second, sorry, <clears throat> it's also called watt. And so, we can express fluxes of energy in terms of watt per square meter. And that's the units we use for sensible heat flux, which is something we measure with the decovariance, latent heat flux, which is, um, these are two different forms of energy, uh, which I'm not going to too much in detail um, for. Uh, soil heat flux, that will be how much energy is going, is, instead of across the atmosphere, it's across the soil, but it's the same thing, joule per square meter per second of, in the case of soil. Okay, that's how we express our energy fluxes. Um, <clears throat> okay, now uh, quickly, uh, turbulence, uh, uh, well, turbulence in the atmosphere, just a little bit, some basic concepts. The, the first concept is that there are two states of the atmosphere, in fact, two states for any fluid it, uh, that moves. The movement can be laminar or turbulent. Laminar is when the fluid uh, moves parallel to a surface in kind of a layers. Okay, and so there is no mixing between the layers. Uh, imagine that this is water, it's just moving horizontally without vertical motion. That's a laminar flow. Uh, a turbulent flow is instead, maybe there is a mean flow horizontally, but there is also movement up and down because of these eddies, because of the turbulence, okay? And you can see here kind of a 3D simulation of how a, uh, these vertical structures look like this kind of eddies hmm? uh, again uh, ask me questions at any time okay if you if you have questions okay so now how is this uh, how it does a flow transition between laminar and turbulent hmm? in particular in the atmosphere what is causing the turbulence what is causing this vertical motion well, there are two basic mechanisms for turbulence generation one is mechanical and one is thermal so the mechanical generation of turbulence is due to the fact that there is a surface, right? There is the earth on the bottom, and then there is this wind, right? That is due to large scale pressure gradients. 
So the air is moving horizontally on average because of large scale pressure gradients. However, the surface exerts like the, you know, the canopy, the, the soil, the water, um, exert uh, um, uh, uh, friction. So it, 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 it stops the flow. So close to the surface, uh, the air start, tends to slow down until at the, at the contact with the surface, the movement of the air is, is zero, the wind, the wind is zero. Right, and so what happens is that uh, a profile of wind speed develops in the atmosphere, very close to zero, close to the surface, and up to the you know, mean value of the wind when you go away from the surface. Now, this gradient, so meaning these layers that have different speed, will tend to generate these rolling motions that are depicted here with these blue lines, because there is friction also between the different layers of air. And so the upper layer is going faster and is being slowed down by the lower layer of air that is going slower. And so this will tend to go, the, the upper layer will tend to go down, okay, to slow down and go down. And this will generate this, this eddies, these rolling motions, okay? And that's uh, what we call mechanical generation of turbulence in the atmosphere. Now, uh, a little bit of math here. Uh, if we take this profile, which typically has a logarithmic shape, if we express it on a logarithmic scale in the vertical direction, that curve becomes a straight line. That's kind of the definition, by definition, okay? So we express the vertical profile in a logarithmic scale, uh, we get this line. This line is a slope, right? Uh, the slope of this line, so the slope of the wind profile when expressed in a logarithmic scale, that's called friction velocity, okay? U star. Okay, so we have this wind profile, U. So U is the wind, horizontal wind, as a function of height, but we have expressed it as a function of the logarithm of the height, okay? Forget that zeta zero and K doesn't matter now. Um, the proportionality factor between the wind and the logarithm of Z is, um, has this U star or friction velocity. Uh, that is, K is a constant, okay? It's 0 0.4, it doesn't matter what it is, it's just a number. Uh, so U star, friction velocity, will tell us how uh, steep is this line. The larger U star, the larger is the, the slope of this line with respect to the vertical uh, axis. And what happens? The more the, 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 the slope is high, the higher is the slope, the higher is the difference in speed between the different hail layers. And so the higher is the probability that these rolling motions will start. Okay, and so friction velocity as the slope of this line is a quantification of how likely it is that there is turbulence in the atmosphere due to this mechanical friction process. Okay, so U star, which is a number ranging zero to more or less 1.5 meter per second, so it's, it's a unit of a speed, uh, is a number that, okay, when U star is 0 0.8, let's say meter per second, well, it's quite likely that the atmosphere is going to be turbulent because the slope of this line is pretty, pretty steep. When you start is more like 0 0.1 meter per second, that's unlikely because the, it means that the slope is quite uh, shallow. So the air, the, the different speed between the different layers is small. And so we don't necessarily have this generation of, of turbulence, okay? Uh, in the same case, when the line is completely vertical, the slope is zero, uh, in that case, uh, we have no difference in air speed between the different layers, and so there is no generation of mechanical turbulence. So very important concept to use star friction velocity. The other mechanism for generating turbulence is uh, thermal, as I said before, and that's a little bit maybe more intuitive, more present in our daily life, is you know this um, essentially the uh, solar radiation hits the surface of the Earth, and this will... So the, the, the surface will be hotter than the air above. And at some point, so it will warm up the, the air, right? And so this creates kind of bubbles of warm air close to the surface. And these bubbles will uh, at some point detach and uh, be, because of uh, buoyancy will tend to go up. Mm? Uh, less uh, higher temperature, less density, so less weight. And so uh, the, the air will tend to go up. 
And you will generate this mo upwards movement, which is compensated by a downward movement uh, due to because the colder air that is above is displaced by the warmer air going up. And so it will tend to go down to conserve the mass. And so this will generate these convective cells, convective movements. Huh? And that's what's what um, a, I don't know what it's called this thing, but uh, people going with the kites that you know, they use this to, to stay afloat, to stay in the atmosphere, to, on the air as long as possible because they use this upward motion um, uh, due to, to thermal effects. Um, there is uh, an, so you, we, can, we can quantify this uh, uh, um, thermal uh, potential for thermal turbulence using the sensible flux or the uh, buoyancy flux. There is essentially the flux of warm air moving upwards. Okay, we call it H. And so we have friction velocity U star that uh, is a part, is a quantification of uh, potential for mechanical turbulence, and then we have H, which is a sensible heat flux, and it's a potential for um, thermal turbulence. And with these two quantities, we can build um, um, a new number, a new variable, which is useful, which is called L, uh, Moninobkov length. It's designed uh, designated with L usually, uh, which is proportional through a certain factor to minus U star uh, uh, to the, um, the cube of U star uh, over sensible flux. Okay, so that's a ratio that essentially tells us. Um, if uh, the relative importance of mechanical versus thermal turbulence in the atmosphere, okay? So this concept, U star, H, L, these uh, variables will show up a lot uh, in the eddy covariance uh, 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 well, practice. So it's important to be familiar with, this, with these concepts. Okay, another concept is atm atmospheric stability. Um, we just spoke about these convective cells, right? Um, so when the when the situation is like daytime, typically uh, you have this uh, warm uh, surface heating up uh, the air and then these convective cells, we call that an unstable um, uh, atmosphere, unstable stratification, because it's unstable, right? Uh, the temperature gradient is such that air will tend to go upwards and downwards with these convective cells. The opposite situation is typically during night when you have a stable stratification. In that case, the temperature is colder, um, it was lower close to the surface and, and, and warmer uh, away from the surface. So the air close to the surface is denser, so heavier than the one away from the surface. And that is a stable situation because there is no um, incentive for the air to, to move anywhere. Uh, the cold air stays there, the warm air stays there, so there is no vertical uh, exchange of, of you know, no convective cells. Uh, the situation in between is a neutral stratification when you have uh, no gradient of temperature. And so it's, it's neutral in the sense that uh, if you put an air parcel anywhere, it will tend to stay where, where it is mm -hmm. instead of going down, like in the stable stratification, or going up, like in the unstable um, stratification. And uh, we use a parameter called Z over L, where the L is the, our morning obkov length, and Z is the measurement height, so wherever we put ourselves to measure. Uh, this Z over L parameter is a stability parameter that is uh, negative in case of uh, unstable stratification, is positive in stable stratification, and is close to zero in neutral stratification. Um, another important concept, concept in the atmosphere is a constant flux layer. So what, that, what is that? So we want to measure uh, the fluxes, right? And the fluxes of what? Well, the fluxes of, say, CO2 uh, from a certain ecosystem. It can be a crop field or it can be a forest. Let's say the, the example of a forest, okay? Now, we don't want to measure a specific tree. We want to measure, on average, the forest. If we put ourselves to um, measure very close to the, to the canopy, for example, if, we, if you can see my mouse, I hope you do, uh, if, if I put myself to measure here, you can imagine intuitively that uh, the trees that are closer to me will impact the measurement. They will have an effect on the turbulence, right? Because they are like obstacles for the wind, right? Uh, they will have an effect that I, I will be measuring mostly what these trees are doing in terms of CO2 exchange and also the turbulence that is generated by these trees close to my measurement point. 
That's what we call the roughness sublayer. Uh, in the roughness sublayer, the dynamics of the turbulence and the exchange that we will measure with an equivalent system would depend on where we put ourselves to measure. If I if I'm here, I measure something. If I'm here, I measure something else. If I'm here, I measure something else. The roughness of the surface has an impact on what happens right in the roughness sublayer. But if I go far enough, I high, what happens is that this specificity of the turbulence closest to the um, to the surface, we tend to smooth out, we tend to average out in such a way that now if I'm in this pink zone here, it doesn't matter anymore. If I'm measuring here or here or here or here or here, um, I will always measure more or less the same thing, which is sort of an average of what happens down below at the canopy level. No longer a specific tree or a specific patch as any um, um, dominates the measurement, is more the average. So that's where we want to be when we want to do uh, a decovalence measurements. And this height extends for more or less double the canopy height, all the way to 100, 150 meters, where then something else happens which we are not interested in. Okay, but that's our range of height where we can measure. And if we are there, we can also move horizontally. Uh, and as long as the footprint, which is another concept you talk about later. Um, as long as the footprint uh, is within the forest, then we are good. We are measuring more or less the average of the behavior of the whole forest and not a specific tree or patch. Um, okay. So that's it. So with this concept uh, introduced, uh, I'm now going through the mathematical derivation I was talking about uh, that will lead us to, to the working eddy equivalence equation. Again, what's important is the endpoint and the assumptions that I make to go from the beginning to the end point. That's the important part that I would like you to, to, to grasp. You don't need to grasp the specific uh, specifics of the mathematics, but of course, if you do, that doesn't harm. So imagine we have a, a forest and we want to measure the exchange of CO2 of this forest with the atmosphere. That exchange is, for example, it's easier to visualize, in my mind at least, uh, for respiration in the night. So CO2 is being emitted by the forest, not uptaken, okay? So it's like a fire. There is CO2 emitted by, by the plants. We want to measure where this, where is this CO2 going, right? Um, and so we imagine like a, a, a cube or a, this kind of geometry here around the forest. Ideally, we want to measure what happens, what the CO2 does across all these surfaces, so the fluxes, right, across these surfaces. Mm -hmm. But we can't do that really, uh, because it's uh, uh, well, it's too much, too much to do in practice. So what we want to do is that instead we want to simplify the problem, and we want to find a mathematical formulation that is simple enough so that we can actually develop. Uh, and deploy a system that can measure, that can um, realize the, the equation that we will end up with. But at the same time, this mathematical formulation needs to be general enough to be representative of what happens in the ecosystem, okay? So we have two uh, kind of um, attention between two different needs, and we have to find a trade-off between simplicity and generality of our mathematical formulation, okay? so. Um, I, the end point of this is that we will realize that we can only we can measure only the vertical flux, so the vertical the, the flux through, through the horizontal surface, as I said at the beginning, and we can ignore the other ones. Okay, but let's go uh, to that step by step. So this is the most general. It's called uh, this equation with strange symbols. Uh, this is called Navier-Stokes equation. It's a very basic fundamental uh, equation of physics. It's right there with E equal MC squared or, or you know, Maxwell equations, the very fundamental equations of physics. And it describes how stuff moves in the, in the turbulence, in a turbulent flow, whether it's in air, in water, in any kind of fluid. C is our concentration. And um, that, that's what we are interested in. We want to track how this concentration changes as it is being transported in this turbulent flow. Hmm? That's Navier-Stokes equation, and it's true in, in the engine of a spacecraft, uh, as it is true, uh, valid, I mean, the equation, valid in the atmosphere for, for CO2, okay? Uh, 
Okay, so now let's look at, at this equation in some details. <clears throat> uh, Gerardo. Yeah. There's, there's a question um, about um, from from uh, and it's asking is the constant flux layer height the same for all kind of ecosystem? For example, is is it the same for grassland ecosystem? <clears throat> yeah. The the um, the so the the bottom layer is depending on the canopy height, more or less. And I mean, it's, a, it's roughly, it's not really, but it's about uh, after two or three times the height of the canopy, the roughness doesn't matter anymore. That, that's the bottom layer. The upper uh, limit of the constant flux layer really depends mostly on what happens above, in the layers above, but roughly uh, it's you know between 100 and 150 meters. We never measure higher than that anyway. You know, it's just, just impractical. Uh, so yeah, that that's uh, that's the typical range of the concept flux layer. So is it the same? Is it almost the same for uh, every ecosystem? It depends more on on what happens above in terms of the top, than than it depends on what happens below because you know ra trees range from what one meter of a, a crop field to what. 15 meter, 20 meter of a forest, 25. Um, if that answers, uh, I, I take it back from here. Uh, so uh, as, as I was saying, <laughs> we, um, we want to follow, for example, think about it. We think about a, a small volume, like a, like a, a, a square, whatever, centimeter. Um, we want to follow the concentration of the gas, CO2, in that volume as time passes, okay? So we track the time rate of change of concentration in that volume. Okay, how does, why does it change the concentration in that volume? Well, it changes for different reasons. The, the, the most, the easiest to understand is molecular diffusion. Imagine that the concentration in this little cubic centimeter is different from the concentration of CO2 outside of that cube. Well, in that case, even if there is no air movement, you have a molecular diffusion that will tend to equalize that gradient, that difference. And so there would be a movement of air, of CO2, out or in the, the little volume because of molecular diffusion. That's our first reason for the change in uh, concentration in our little volume. The second is the turbulent transport. Now, this is not a, a steel air, this is a moving air. So it's very easy to think, well, okay, there is this little volume of air coming through. If this air is taking, for example, CO2-free hmm, air through the volume, well, I can imagine that my concentration will uh, decrease in the volume because I have my CO2 that is being mixed with uh, CO2-free air. So the, the mean concentration will decrease. So this, this um, term, turbulent transport, will depend on the wind. U is the wind vector. So it's a short, you know, it's, it's bold character. It's a short for U, V, and W, the three wind components in space, okay? Uh, so it depends on the wind in all directions, and it depends on the gradient of CO2. If there is no wind, there is no turbulent transport. But also if there is no gradient, there is no turbulent transport. Hmm? So if the CO2 is the same here and there, it doesn't matter if the air is moving stuff around, the concentration is going to stay the same in my volume. The third uh, and last term is the source and sink term. So now imagine that inside that volume, uh, you have a creation of CO2. For example, there is a little plant in your cubic centimeter, and this is uh, um, respiring, is that the term? So this is emitting CO2. You have, you have creation of CO2 in the air in that volume. So even in the absence of diffusion or molecular or turbulent transport, you're going to have an increase of CO2 because the, the plant is emitting CO2. So that, these are the three basic ways in which the concentration in the, our little cube can change in the atmosphere. OK, so. Um, hopefully, it doesn't matter what the symbols are, this gradient, this, this thing. That, it doesn't matter, just, just listen to the concept, uh, unless you know what they mean. Um, now, another important concept, because we are talking about turbulence, so we're talking about stuff happening in time and changing with time, okay? 
we need to define somehow a, uh, some sort of mean value and some sort of um, uh, fluctuating term. Okay, so imagine now any variable could be CO2, could be temperature, like in this plot, can be anything. I call it X. Hmm? You can think of CO2 concentration, for example. So that concentration will change with time. So in a certain amount of time, for example, we can take half an hour, we can define a mean value for that concentration. And then there is a fluctuation around that mean value. Hmm? So if you look at the plot, this is the time series of temperature in this case. Over time, this is a short time, uh, 100 seconds, but think of it, um, for example, half an hour, which is a typical time averaging interval for us. And, and so as I have this up and down here, I can calculate the mean value, right? Which is, would be this line. And then I can calculate for each point, how far it is from that mean value. So the mean value is 26 for example. And then there is a fluctuation, for example, here of about two degrees. Mm -hmm. So the total temperature in this point is 28 and is made of an average, which I uh, denote with a bar, an average of 26 plus a, a fluctuation of two. Or for example, here, it could be the opposite. is the average, an average of 26 minus a fluctuation of, for example, one degree to give me a 25 total temperature. So fluctuations can be positive and negative, of course, around the mean value, okay? Now, because uh, in order to define a mean value uh, that is meaningful in physics, I can always do a mean value in mathematics, but to be meaningful in physics, I need to assume something that we call stationarity. Stationarity means that if I take 30 minutes or I take 20 minutes or, or 40 minutes, I have a mean value of the concentration that is more or less stable. It's never really going to be fixed, but it's going, it's going to be stable. If I average over 20, 30, or 40 minutes, the concentration will be, on average, will be roughly the same, OK? So that's a, it's called a stationarity assumption, and it's an important assumption, OK? The atmosphere should be stationary. Uh, that will allow us to define this mean value. And so around that mean value, we can define a fluctuation. Now, this operator is called Reynolds averaging operator, Reynolds averaging rule. Uh, it's a mathematical operator that has some characteristics, some properties. And uh, they are indicated here. I'm not going through that. But it's important to note that if I take the average of the fluctuations, OK, if x prime fluctuations averaged, that is 0 by definition. Okay, by definition, this is always true if the bar and the prime have, are defined in this way as a mean value and the fluctuations around the mean value. Okay, now we have this operator, this mathematical operator. We have our equation, our equation. What we do is we apply this operator to the equation, okay? Um, and that would be this, okay? So this is the same equation as before, but with a bar over each term. I can always do that, right? Because left and right uh, uh, terms are equal, so they stay equal if I apply the same operator to both of them, okay? So same equation, except now we have these bars. Now I take each variable, like C, and I decompose it into the mean value, C bar, plus the fluctuating uh, value, that is C prime, okay? Like we did before with X. Now we do it with C. And we do it with U, and we do it with S, okay? The source term, and U is the width. And so we, we just made this equation longer, but it's the same equation. Uh, C bar plus C prime time derivative is the same as time derivative of C, and so forth for the rest. And then we have applied this bar on top of it. Hmm? Now we use the, uh, the, the these properties of this operator, which I'm not going to, to do in details. I will just show you the result. Uh, but you can trust me that you can derive the equation that I'm going to show from this equation, which is, again, the same as this equation, OK? So I do some uh, um, algebraic um, uh, stuff, and I get to this equation. Now, it looks more complicated. <laughs> it's a bit more complicated, but it's the same stuff. We still recognize. Gerardo. Yeah. 
Can I interrupt again? Um, so uh, I've got two quick questions. First one, why do we typically um, average over a 30 minute period? Mm -hmm. And um, if you can just add this, over what time frame must the atmosphere remain stationary for this assumption to hold? Right. So if you can, yeah. yeah. The second question is, um, the it's easier <laughs> and it's, um, uh, the session, we assume sessionality across those 30 minutes. Okay. Um, that's it. Of course, if you do fluxes over 50 minutes, then you are assuming sessionality over 50 minutes. If you do over an hour, you assume sessionality over an hour. Now, typically, we do 30 minutes because it's a compromise. Uh, we would like to do as long as possible. But the problem is, for example, in, in the morning, right? Um, temperature will increase because of sun um, radiation, right? And so over an hour, it's unlikely that the temperature will have a, a constant mean value. The, the temperature will tend to increase, okay? So it, it will always increase. And so even over 30 minutes, we are going to have an instationarity, but that instationarity will be stronger as we increase that time, okay? Um, there is something called spectral gap, which is a kind of a difficult concept um, that requires understanding of um, spectra and cospectra in the atmosphere, which I don't have time to go into. But the point is, the dynamic of turbulence happens on time scales shorter than 30 minutes. The dynamics of the daily pattern, so the, for example, the daily radiation of the sun, which drives lots of daily uh, curves, right? Um, that happens on time scales that are a bit longer than 30 minutes. So 30 minutes is sort of a, a compromise between uh, wanting to grasp all of the turbulent motions, but not wanting to grasp the long term, longer term, the um, daily pattern due to solar radiation. So that's why 30 minutes. It's not um, it's not a mathematically or physically rigorous choice. It's it's a compromise between these two different needs. It can be seen much better if you if you could look at the spectra uh, or cos spectra uh, again, which is something I can't uh, explain, I cannot introduce here. But essentially, what we see is it's called a spectral gap because the amount of um, variability in the concentration, for example, of uh, CO2, uh, so the variability mm, of the concentration has less intensity, has less uh, dynamics at that 30 minute mark, while it has more dynamics at lower time scales or higher time scales or longer time scales. Right? Again, uh, at shorter time scales, 10 minutes, five minutes, one minute, the concentration of CO2 will change because of turbulence. On longer time scales, it will change because of the daily pattern. On 30 minutes, it's kind of where it changes the least. Okay, that's the explanation. All right, so now we recognize similar terms as before, uh, except now they are applied to the C bar. So this is now not the time of uh, rate of change of concentration, but it's rate of change of the mean concentration, okay? Uh, but otherwise it's very similar. The C over the T is the change in time. This is our sourcing term. Now it's not instantaneous, it is over 30 minutes, for example. Let's take 30 minutes. And then you have the molecular diffusion over 30 minutes. So the gradient of CO2 over 30 minutes. Uh, and then we have these two different terms coming from the turbulence, from the wind uh, stuff. One only has bars, you see? So U bar multiplied by dc over the x. Uh, x, y, z is the three dimensions of the space. So this, this we call advective transport by mean wind. So the mean wind in the three directions, U, V, W, uh, multiplied by the gradient of CO2 in those same directions, U with X, V with Y, and W with Z. This is what we call the uh, mean, uh, well, tra advective transport by mean wind. The other one is our turbulent transport. Okay, now there are bars here, but the terms inside have the primes. The primes are the fluctuations, the stuff that changes quickly. So that's the turbulence, that's these eddies creating these up and down movements, okay? Um, and so, yeah, uh, these are, it, it's the, how the reasons why the mean concentration changes in time uh, in our little volume. 
Now, now comes the important part. This is the important slide, okay? So focus on this one. Uh, how can we simplify this equation so that we can actually measure something? Because measuring all this stuff is practically impossible, okay? So the first assumption we uh, make is that the molecular diffusion, diffusion is negligible in a turbulent flow. So that means that the exchange of CO2 in our volume is going to be dominated by the wind, okay? And the molecular diffusion is essentially uh, negligible, which is pretty much always true. This assumption allows us to eliminate this term, okay? That's very easy. Molecular diffusion doesn't matter. Horizontal variations of mean concentration. So horizontal variations of mean concentration. So the, the C bar over the X, the C bar over the Y, are negligible. That's our second assumption. So we assume that the concentration of CO2 does not change in horizontally in space. Hmm? So that means our forest on average is kind of doing the same everywhere, okay? And so this allows us to eliminate these two terms. Hmm? Uh, the third assumption is that the mean vertical velocity is zero. So W bar is zero. Hmm? That's also a valid assumption. The wind, on average, doesn't go upwards or downwards. It goes horizontally. The mean vertical wind is typically um, close to zero, at least in a relatively flat, uniform landscape. And that's why, in a decoherence, we say we need the surface to be horizontal, because that's when uh, those assumptions hold the best. W bar is close to zero. Horizontal gradients of CO2 are close to zero. So we can uh, neglect these terms, okay? W bar zero, very important. And then we have a, a fourth assumption that is the turbulent, turbulence, now so the fluctuations, the primes mm, is homogeneous in the horizontal direction. Mm. So the C prime over the X, the C prime over the Y, uh, these terms are zero. Mm. This is our fourth assumption. So that means that the turbulence is structurally the same in all directions. And again, that is uh, a consequence of homogeneity of the, um, of the um, canopy. If the canopy is disomogeneous, for example, you have here a uh, grass and here you have a forest, well, the turbulence is not gonna be the same structurally. And so that's uh, this uh, assumption is violated. But as long as you stay on top of the same forest and the forest is relatively homogeneous, uh, then you can safely assume these two terms to be zero. And so we are left with the first term, the, this term here, and the source sink term, okay? That's, if you could take, get one slide from the whole presentation is this one, which are the simplifying assumptions. And so what does our site need to look like when we want to do a decovariance uh, measurement? I have to rush because I think I'm running late. Um, so, as we simplify the, the equation, we end up with this equation. If you are very, you follow very closely, you will notice that this term is different from this term. But I can assure you that you can write that term in, in this way. Um, and the reason is beyond, um, we have the time for that. Uh, but we recognize those terms, right? The, time, the rate of change of CO2, the source sink term, and this one uh, leftover turbulent, turbulence term. Okay, where I took the W prime, W prime into the derivative. Okay. Okay, this tells us that the time variation of the mean scalar, scalar concentration is equal to the difference between all that is absorbed and released, so the source sink term, and all that is transported away vertically, vertically, because this is a derivative in space over Z, so vertically, by the turbulence field, the W prime C prime. Okay, and here you start to see the covariance. This term here is the covariance, hmm? W prime C prime bar. Okay, so we have done this uh, uh, reasoning on a volume, on a little volume. Hmm? Uh, now, if we uh, imagine that we want to extend this over the entire ecosystem, because our only derivative in space is over the vertical direction, we only need to integrate that equation in the vertical direction. Horizontally, nothing is happening. There is no, by means of our assumptions, there is no need to quantify what happens through the horizontal surfaces. And so we take that equation and we integrate it 
This is a mathematical operator, integ integration. We integrate it be between the soil uh, level and the measurement height that we chose, so the top of this volume. Uh, so zeta goes from zero to the measurement height hm. And these are the same terms as before. Now, real quick, this term is the most important term. The source sink term integrated over space represent the exchange of the surface to so the forest, the trees, the soil, the leaves, the exchange of uh, CO2 between that surface that is essentially the outside of our forest with the air, our sourcing term. is our flat, is our net, net ecosystem exchange, right? That's what we care about, is the flux. Hmm? The flux meaning the exchange between what is solid and what is air. Okay, so I uh, another thing to, to notice, this is the integral of a derivative uh, and that the true oper operator specific cancel out. And so only the covariance remain, this W prime C prime bar can be, it remains when I do the integration of the derivative. Okay, you can trust me on that too. And so now I can put F, our, our flux, our exchange on the left side to give it relevance. And I bring the uh, this the c over the t uh, on the right side, and so now I have this equation, okay, which is the same as this, except I I just call this stuff f, okay, and I eliminate the integral and derivative from this term because they are inverse operators, and so now I have this equation that tells me that the exchange flux f is given by what is transported away vertically. Okay, I will talk about this in a moment if I have time. Um, Frederick, you stop me when I have to stop, okay? Uh, so uh, the exchange flux is equal to what is transported away vertically by the turbulence, okay? And the sum of all that is accumulated or stored in time between the surface and the measurement point. So this is what we call the storage term, hmm? the variation in concentration under our measurement point, which you know, you can think of it as under the canopy, okay? In other terms, in more familiar ecological terms, the net ecosystem exchange, F, is given by the sum of the turbulent vertical flux, which is this guy here, the covariance, and the storage flux, which is this guy here. That's the, work, the working equation. That's the equation we use in a decovariance. Um, these are the terms that we want to measure in a decovariance. And we can do this starting from those Navier-Stokes equation because we assume all those stuff, the stationarity, uh, the fact that horizontally nothing happens, the W bar, so the vertical wind speed on average is zero. These assumptions allow us to simplify the equation in this way, okay? Okay, um, quick question. Yeah. So uh, how can uh, vertical velocity be zero when there's convection and buoyancy? Are we neglecting uh, temperature stratification? No, it's, uh, it's on average zero. Um, w, uh, so you have to think of W bar as an average in point and and space. Okay, in that's another another uh, concept, frozen turbulence um, assumption that is basically we measure in time. What imagine that the, the <clears throat> turbulent structure is frozen and just moves around. So we instead of measuring, we would like to measure this surface all over the place, right? Uh, to see what happens at the different points, but we only measure in one point. So we are assuming that what by averaging in time, we are also averaging in space. Okay. And um, and so there would be movements up and down, right? In time and in space, such that on average, W bar would be zero. Um, of course, that's true if we are in a in homogeneous horizontal, uh, or horizontally homogeneous situation, okay? And the, the surface is also horizontal. In a slope, that might not be the case. W bar might not be zero uh, over 30 minutes. Uh, or if there is, for example, uh, a clear cut and there is a forest around that, well, that, that could be a situation where systematically the wind will be, the vertical wind will be different from zero, either uh, downwards or upwards That when there is a flux divergence, but yeah. But on average, you can assume that W bar is any in practice that's the case, it's very close to zero. 
Yeah. So close to zero that it's difficult to measure really. All right. So if we if we aim to finish uh, at the top of the hour, and then uh, yeah. Natalia can come in. Yeah. Yeah. I'm basically okay. finished. So. Okay. Um, so I go back here. Okay, so this is the working equation. The, the, the first term is what gives eddy covariance the name because that's a covariance. Okay. Um, maybe if I find that actually, okay, it's simply the product. If you think of 30 minutes, W prime and C prime are just the fluctuations as I showed before, the fluctuations of the variable, variables, the two variables. Uh, you make the, the um, multiplication of them and then take an average of these multiplications. Okay, uh, maybe I pull up the, the equation very quickly in a moment. Um, that's the covariance term that gives the, uh, the method the name, add the covariance, add the for turbulence, covariance for covariance. Uh, and this is the storage term, which in most cases we can actually ignore. For example, on a crop field, uh, we tend to ignore the storage because there is no storage. Um, the CO2 doesn't tend to accumulate between the surface and the measurement point in a crop field. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe during the night there could be some some certification because of a stable atmosphere and so there could be some more co2 but a, a very light breeze we just take it away we we'll mix stuff up under a, a forest instead that situation is different because there might be no wind at all during the night and so the co2 that is uh, emitted by the by the respiration will accumulate under the canopy and so this storage term will be different from zero uh, during the night, for example. But then on a 24 hours time scale, tendentially goes to zero because what is accumulated during the night will tend to flush out during the day. And so there is no real long-term CO2 accumulation under the canopy, right? And so uh, in many cases, we don't measure this thing also just because it's complicated and, and kind of expensive. So, but uh, at the very least, you want to measure uh, the turbulence flux on top of the canopy that captures what happens between the soil and the top of the canopy when there is turbulence, okay? And so to do that, we use, we have to measure the wind, the vertical wind and the concentration. So we use a gas analyzer for the concentration and a sonic anemometer, typically. Anemometer is a wind measurement device that can measure the wind in the three direction uh, very fast. And so we use the uh, instantaneous measurement of wind from the sonic anemometer, the instantaneous measurement from a gas analyzer, we make the multiplication of their fluctuations and we take the average of those multiplications over 30 minutes, and that's our uh, turbulent flux. That's how we do a decobalance, essentially. So I'll, I'll leave it at this, except if I have a minute, I pull up, um, I pull up the covariance equation uh, from here from Wikipedia. Um, so covariance is, is a, just a mathematical operation. Let's see, it is a, a simple version of that. You can see my screen, right? Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Okay, so, okay. so um, think of X and Y in this equation here as uh, the wind, W, so X will be W, and Y will be C, the concentration. Okay, so uh, this equation is uh, similar to what I showed before. You would take the instantaneous value of the concentration minus the mean value. So that's the fluctuation, uh, what we called prime before. Uh, that's for the wind, that's for the concentration. And then we simply make an average. N is the number of points. For example, in our case, would be um, the number of points in 30 minutes. We take, make an average of that multiplication between the fluctuations of the two quantities. That's the definition of covariance. It just had, so happens that the navier stokes equation simplified to a covariance, and that's why we use the covariance in our uh, mathematical formulation. And the covariance, of course, you know, if it's a gas, is a, a covariance of W with C concentration. But if it's the heat, the, the flux of temperature or the the flux of um, sensible heat. That would be W prime, T prime, temperature prime, so fluctuations of temperature. Um, if it's a uh, uh, latent heat flux, uh, that would be something proportional to the to the flux of water. We don't, I don't go too much into it. Uh, there is also momentum flux. Momentum is another form of energy, it's a mechanical energy. In that case, we take the fluctuations of the W, so vertical speed, 
with the horizontal with speed. That's a quantification of essentially the transport of kinetic energy up and down in the atmosphere. So it's, it's always the covariance between W and another quantity, the quantity relevant to what you want to measure. Okay, I'll stop it here. Um, there are maybe two minutes for questions if we want to stop at the hour. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Gerardo, for that um, introduction to eddy covariance theory. Um, I have I have learned a lot uh, over the last one hour, and I I, I hope um, other participants have also um, learned a lot from you. Um, Gerardo will be in the meeting until the end, so if you if you have any questions, you can um, hold on, and and he'll come back towards the end again. Um, all of us, um, I'm going to share the link to our Slack channel um, where you can we can continue the interactions even after um, the next one hour. So um, please stay on and, and, and if you have any more questions, you can ask them to um, Gerardo at the end. Um, for now, though, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Caleb, who will introduce the next speaker, um, Natalia. Okay, thank you so much, Fred. Um, so I would just want to say a very big thank you to Gerardo who kickstarted the meeting. And I hope we have all been very quite enlightened, especially with the basic principles regarding the eddy covariance method. And uh, to begin with, I would uh, like to remind us all again about this workshop. This is a FlaxNet ECN workshop um, that we are trying to, uh, that is being organized. It's a three day, actually three day workshop. It's being held uh, simultane uh, simultaneously um, across three time zones. That's the Asia part, and then we have the Africa, European section, and then the Americas and Caribbean. So this is the Africa, Europe session. And if you just joined us, Welcome once again. We were so much enlightened by uh, Gerardo. And we would like to now zoom in to, uh, to our second speaker, who is uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Natalia Kowalska. Uh, she is an associate scientist with the Department of Matter and Energy Fluxes with the Global Change Research Institute, Czech Academy of Sciences. And she's also the PI of the meteorological station, that's ICOS class one station in a flat plain forest um, ecosystem in Landshot. So Natalia, welcome. And we know you are also going to add up to where Geraldo also stopped. And so now okay. the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. So I will start sharing my screen. All right, that, let me just quickly stop this. Okay. Okay, participants, yes. Uh, okay, so yes, okay, I'll stop. try now. No. Okay, can you see my screen? I believe. Yes. Okay. So my name is Natalia Kowalska. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And today I will talk about the eddy covariance general principles of micrometeorology, instrumentation, flux tower site design, and eddy covariance measurements. Uh, some topics uh, we will have um, overlapped uh, with Gerardo, but uh, I will talk this a little bit uh, from, from different perspectives. So I hope you will enjoy. Uh, first, I will start uh, with some introductions. So once again, we will repeat uh, the key terms and definitions. Uh, then uh, I will talk about the instrumentation, uh, then about the construction of eddy covariance tower, uh, footprint, experimental design, and at the end, I will summarize the main principles of the eddy covariance method. Uh, Natalia, sorry to cut you in. Uh, would you also want to uh, go by the same style Gerardo date, like to take questions uh, as you go along, or you do want to finish the presentation? Yeah, it can be, it can be both. What? Yeah. All right. As you okay. prefer. Yeah. Then you. that's fine. Okay. Thank you. So, eddy covariance is a powerful tool to study eddy covariance um, carbon cycle. Sorry, to study carbon cycle. It's a passive way um, to sample of the land surface exchange of the greenhouse gases between the ecosystem and the atmosphere. 
And ultimately, um, eddy covariance is the statistical method also for computing uh, the turbulence uh, fluxes, and you can use it for different uh, type of uh, purposes. So first, as I mentioned, we will um, remember the flux, the basic definition. Uh, and this is the you know, flux uh, is telling us how much of gas or energy moves through a um, unit of time uh, between the surface and the atmosphere. And here, when we uh, will talk about eddy covariance, we are going to talk about uh, flux that is um, orient or originated uh, from and integrated over an area of size of ranging from uh, hundreds of meters to kilometers. So for example, if uh, 100 um, micromole of CO2 uh, moves through one square meter window each second, then the flux of CO2 is, as it's written, 100 micromole of CO2 per square meter per second. It's, we are writing in this, in this way. Uh, this diagram, I think uh, most of you know, uh, however, it's very, very basic. Eddy covariance uh, tower uh, with a bunch of instrumentation allows us to measure what is happening with the wind and what is going with that and what is going on with this wind uh, has a lot of uh, really relevant information to what is happening with the ecosystem. And so all the sensors installed uh, at the tower are making measurement of traditional weather like uh, solar radiation, wind speed, temperature, humidity, but also a bunch of really advanced sensors that are giving us information about how much carbon dioxide is going up uh, versus uh, how much is going down. And that's really important to understand how the ecosystem is uh, behaving, so uh, how it is um, uh, functioning. Uh, ultimately, also, we have the opportunity to measure the photosynthesis and uh, ecosystem respiration. Uh, next to the carbon fluxes with the eddy covariance method, we can also measure the uh, water vapor, so the evapotranspiration rates to study different changes uh, to the ecosystem that have an effect of the, on the evapotranspiration. But okay, what is uh, the eddy covariance method? To answer on this question, we need to uh, come back to some similar slide about the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, because with eddy covariance um, method, we are measuring uh, within this layer and especially in uh, the constant flux layer. Already Gerardo mentioned about that. So forces like drag, pressure, uh, gradient or Coriolis forces that can act on the air parcels in the atmospheric boundary layer are considered negligible uh, for a flat, horizontally homogeneous surface boundary layer above the roughness elements. Uh, simplifying, we are uh, conducting eddy covariance measurements in the constant flux layer because uh, the flux changes are so small that they are considered as a, uh, as a negligible in this area. But uh, let's have a closer look at the um, um, gas transfer in this uh, constant flux layer. So based on decades on the scientific uh, research, we, are, we can uh, reasonably assume that uh, transfer in the constant layer is conducted uh, only by the turbulence and uh, mixing, and that there is no divergence and the convergence for homogeneous horizontal terrain. But under these two assumptions, the flux at uh, x and y direction is equal to zero. And uh, sometimes it's very hard to understand uh, what is this uh, X and Y direction. So let's uh, imagine uh, the box. Uh, uh, you can see now, yeah. Uh, so again, under these two assumptions saying that flux transfer is uh, in the constant layer is conducted only by the turbulence and mixing and that there is no divergence and the covergence for homogeneous horizontal terrain. It means vertical flow is assumed negligible for a horizontal homogeneous terrain. So now you can see that this uh, X and Y direction uh, um, uh, are equal zero. For example, if there is one gram of CO2 uh, coming into the box and at the same time one gram of CO2 uh, leaving the box, then the amount of CO2 in the box time doesn't change. So now we can easily see uh, if we will figure out the way uh, to measure the flux in the vertical direction, we would be able to determine the flux in the um, whole uh, constant uh, layer. And how big is the flux? 
we can calculate with the equations, which uh, very uh, much uh, in details uh, Gerardo already said. So I will just mention that the vertical uh, flux can be represented as a covariance of the vertical velocity and concentration of the entity of interest. So um, we have the classical equation for the eddy flux, uh, where the flux is equal uh, to the product of the mean air density multiplied by the uh, mean covariance between the vertical wind speed and the gas uh, emission ratio. Of course, those um, equations we can apply for different gases. And for eddy covariance um, measurements, we need uh, basically two uh, instruments, the gas analyzer and uh, uh, sonic anemometer. Gas analyzer, which uh, has the capacity to sample greenhouse gas concentration of different gases uh, very rapidly, and sonic anemometer, which is measuring wind speed and uh, air temperature. Okay, then we have the um, two instruments here, the gas analyzer and the sonic anemometer, but how to merge the data coming from those two instruments. So for this, we need some uh, additional um, interface unit, uh, which for example, uh, in LICOR, um, um, it is uh, 7,550. And thanks to this unit, we can uh, merge the data into, um, into one file. We can integrate them. Um, this is very uh, impressive instrumentation. Uh, it has the USB, so you can easily uh, lock your data. Um, it has also the um, different Ethernet input and output, so you can connect different uh, instruments, um, computers. You can have also uh, uh, remote access to your data. So it's very uh, comfortable. Also, it's very um, reliable and uh, it has also the uh, big range uh, of, um, so it can, it could work in very big range of temperatures. So minus uh, 40 until plus uh, 85. So it's uh, really uh, a good one. So, but why do we need so fast responding um, instruments? So imagine the eddy travels along the wind direction at time one. Uh, so at this time, when the instruments are taking the uh, measurement, the eddy is away from the tower. Uh, however, when the instruments um, take the next measurement, the measurement two, uh, then the eddy has already passed the tower. So this eddy measurement is missed. But nowadays, uh, state-of-the-art art instruments um, can detect very small changes at the very high frequency. Uh, they measure with the frequency 20 hertz, uh, so 20 times per second, uh, to capture different kind of um, rapid uh, changes uh, occurring in the atmosphere. Uh, based on the type of the gas analyzer in the flux uh, measurement, um, um, eddy covariance system is usually, usually classified as an open path or closed path. Uh, in the open path system, the air moves freely through the path of the gas analyzer, but uh, in the closed path, uh, the air is uh, fostered into motion and then uh, pass the pump. So there are uh, three uh, main differences between the um, open and closed path. Uh, regarding the power consumption, regarding the pump requirement, and data loss due to precipitation. So in case of um, precipitation, uh, both uh, open and closed path don't work uh, perfectly. <laughs> However, um, the closed path, uh, in case of closed path data loss uh, due to precipitation is, uh, is smaller, it's minimal. Um, what kind of requirements we have from the instruments? Uh, we as a community uh, working with the Eddy Covariance Tower, we measure um, in really different conditions in different ecosystems, starting from uh, Arctic and all over the way to Antarctica. So uh, we measure also in the rainforest, Everglades and so on. So the instruments uh, really need to be uh, robust. They need to be uh, weatherproof, uh, insensitive to dirt, to dust. They need to be reliable, uh, easy to use for uh, non-technician. Uh, not each group, scientific group has the technician which will uh, regularly support and maintain the tower. Um, it has to uh, be small and manageable size, so it to, to carry, to, um, to maintain in general. And in uh, many cases also, uh, there is a problem with the, uh, the power, so it has to have the low power consumption. 
um, after the theoretical part, after saying all the equations and definitions, uh, we are uh, moving to the practical part. So we want finally to install the edicovariance system. And this is the biggest challenge because any kind of um, oversight uh, you might have in your experimental design and implementation may lead to the bad data collection in the long period uh, that causes uh, later the large data gaps. There is a big desire to integrate the long-term data sets. Uh, this is the main uh, goal when we measure greenhouse gases. Uh, some of the main risks, um, at some, there are some mistakes done during designing and implementation of the eddy covariance system already, and they may not be correctable. So this is the uh, serious issue here. So during data processing, when we do the error, as long as we have the backups of our raw data files, uh, we are safe. Uh, so this is uh, really, really very important to keep your uh, raw data um, because you never know. You can apply uh, different corrections, use different variables and recalculate your data uh, in a different way. But uh, so even if you already calculated the fluxes, keep remember, please keep your raw data always uh, in a safe place. Um, so. There is several ways to execute the covariance method, but uh, standardly applied steps uh, of actions need to be successfully set up uh, uh, the experiment, set up the data collection, and set up the data processing. Uh, so the typical workflow is um, divided into three parts uh, about the design and implementation I will talk today, but about the data processing, you will have uh, the lectures tomorrow. Um, so eddy covariance tower, um, it's a physical structure uh, consisting of several instruments uh, intended to quantify the turbulent transport trace gases between the land surface and the atmosphere to understand how the ecosystem is uh, behaving, functioning. Uh, so we are scientists. Uh, we don't want to just measure. We want to um, understand. Uh, so we want to answer questions, for example, uh, how much carbon dioxide might be going into the soil and staying there, uh, how fluxes vary in different time, different locations, uh, at different seasons. Uh, so this type of questions uh, that are really important for the future of our planet. So the idea is that the net ecosystem exchange, uh, so the NEE, which you can see at the top, uh, is being measured at the tower. And uh, it is a difference between the photosynthesis and the respiration of the ecosystem. So in, in photosynthesis, uh, it's GPP, cross primary production, and the ecosystem respiration recall. So the main key points of setting um, the design are, um, setting the purpose and uh, define your variables, deciding about the software, uh, establishing the location and making the maintenance plan. Uh, but the minor elements uh, uh, of the implementation is uh, placing the tower and instruments, uh, testing the data collection, collecting the data, keeping plan with the maintenance schedule. Uh, now the main characteristic of the, um, of the tower construction. So the tower has to be uh, has to have the access uh, or the access to the tower has to be the whole year long. Uh, the tower has to be uh, stable. Uh, why? Because uh, today we are able to measure the wind direction. Uh, oh, sorry, wind speed with accuracy 0 0.02 uh, meter per second. Uh, so the consequently uh, tower or boom movements uh, should be below this threshold. Instruments uh, should be then installed on the horizontal boom to eliminate the effect uh, uh, of the main obstacle, which is tower. And the tower should be positioned to maximize the exposure time uh, for winds blowing from the desired land cover type and with the longest upwind uh, fetch attainable. Uh, in the forest, uh, towers should be located near trees to mimic the existing mean distance between the trees in the ecosystem. And uh, very important uh, is also uh, to uh, have the proper grounding to avoid potential damage uh, of instruments and loss of data. Uh, now we go to the next uh, definitions. Uh, 
uh, the concept of footprint. So uh, this is essential for proper planning and uh, execution of uh, eddy covariance experiments. So next slides, uh, I will um, dedicate more to this concept and we will go a little bit uh, into details. So when, when we talk about uh, flux footprint, this is area measured by the uh, instruments on the tower. In other words, it is an area upwind uh, from the tower such that the, the flux is generated in this area and measured by the tower instruments. Another frequently used term is uh, fetch. It usually refers to the distance from the tower uh, when describing the potential instruments. So fetch is the maximum distance or area that could be potentially measured by your instruments on the tower. Uh, fetch and footprint are dependent on uh, measurement height, uh, and I will uh, discuss about this uh, here more in detailed way. Uh, also are dependent on the roughness of the surface and stability. Um, and the size of the footprint increases with an increase in measurement height and uh, decrease with the surface roughness and with changes in stability from unstable to stable. So in further part, as I mentioned, we will focus on the uh, effect uh, of measurement height on the, uh, on the location of the tower. So now remember the goal of eddy covariance measurements. Um, your goal is to measure the fluxes of gases and energy from the ecosystem of interest. So if possible, the location of the tower within the site uh, should be optimized to represent the area of interest uh, for most of the wind directions. So it's important that this location should represent the area of interest for the prevailing wind directions. So to accomplish this, uh, um, the instrumentation needs to be placed on the tower uh, or, or on the tree pot um, above the vegetation. So as we described earlier, the wind is uh, full of eddies and uh, moves across the ecosystem and exchange the molecules between this ecosystem and the atmosphere. So the tower um, needs to be located correctly to measure fluxes from the surrounded area, to measure eddies from the ecosystem of interest in, our, in other words. And uh, which height is uh, the appropriate height, um, height of the tower? So here we show the H1, which is the distance from the canopy uh, to the anemometer, and H2, which is the distance from the ground to the, uh, to the anemometer. Uh, so let's go back to the picture with uh, wind profile and the atmospheric layers, uh, which we showed earlier. Um, look at the wind. Yes. Can I just cut you in a little? Yes. There is a question. Yes, sure. Um, so he said, uh, for young scientists who are willing to, to install and manage the eddy covariance tower, how do they identify if there is flow distortion by tower structure? Example, um, so many different types of towers. There are, yeah, so there are these existing towers. So how do you um, identify if there is a flow distortion by the tower structure? Flat distortion or disturb or what I don't under Distortion, uh, that's distortion, a flow distortion um, as an uh -huh. hindrance here yeah, to the to the tower, uh, maybe a cause by the tower, the structure, uh -huh. yeah. Um, okay, okay. In the while, I will also um, talk about this. So maybe okay, just okay. we can say because this, this fine, I will explain in the, in the further slides. Okay, we All can. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank Perfect. You. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, now we'll, let's back to the picture with the wind profile and the atmospheric layers which we uh, showed earlier. So look at the wind profile. If uh, there is bare soil here. Uh, and the wind reaches zero uh, wind speed along the ground surface. So you see this uh, yellow arrow uh, is showing. Uh, but now when we uh, lay the same profile over the ecosystem covered by the vegetation, then we can see that wind speed profile reaches zero at the height within the canopy. And uh, zero plane displacement. Uh, now the next very uh, important um, uh, definition or term uh, to know. So to understand this phenomenon, the plant canopy acts the, uh, as a porous uh, barrier and creates uh, friction for the flow of air uh, across the ecosystem. So the wind profile ends up extending down into about the top one third of the canopy. 
uh, and the tops of the trees acts as a structure that breaks apart eddies and create disturbances uh, affecting wind direction and the wind profile. So as a result, uh, the wind profile is uh, considered uh, to begin at a distance D, so which is the zero plane displacement above the ground. Uh, most of the times, two thirds of the canopy heights is a safe value uh, to use. So there are some, um, from time to time will appear some indications um, on which height uh, we, should, uh, we should install the tower and instruments. So uh, now you have the layer uh, which is directly above the canopy uh, that is still um, affected by the vegetation structures. And this is uh, called roughness sub layer. Uh, but now the roughness sub layer typically includes the top um, one third of the canopy and then extends up to at least twice uh, the height of the canopy. So if you are conducting um, uh, too low uh, or too close to the canopy, then you are within uh, within this uh, roughness sublayer. But uh, in this area, as I mentioned, mixing often can be affected by the structure of the ecosystem. So the turbulence, momentum, and fluxes can be uh, rather episodic, uh, especially during uh, some calmer periods, and eddies may be um, maybe clamped or they may break apart uh, and can be at the end uh, unnatural. Uh, so the measurement uh, should be made up in the constant flex layer, so higher. Um, if it's possible, uh, that's where you can find undisturbed conditions. Uh, so knowing this height and location of the constant flex layer, it should help us in determining the minimum height uh, of the sensors. And if you are unable to get this height, then it's the best uh, to be as close as possible to find this um, ideal, um, ideal height. Um, in addition, also, we don't want to measure uh, too high because we were talking about the minimum height, but we don't want to measure also in the uh, so-called mixed layer. Um, although it is rather not so often happening because this is uh, already above uh, 100 meters. So, but in this layer, eddies are already big and uh, there is small amount of uh, small eddies which are carrying the uh, CO2 um, uh, and water vapor. So at the end, there are two rules, uh, general suggestions to determine the minimum uh, heights. And there is a beautiful uh, graph uh, showing uh, uh, showed by Lycor. Uh, when working on low or small canopies, it's uh, pretty possible to get close to the ground surface. So for example, let's assume we have uh, a large area of grass uh, with the vegetation height, for example, 30 centimeters. And if you use this uh, um, two times the canopy height rule that would locate the sensors a little under, uh, for example, 75 uh, centimeters above the ground. Uh, this is then very good uh, because of the proximity of the ground itself. When this ruling eddies uh, hit the ground surface, they break apart into many eddies and they scatter into different directions. Uh, the sample path of the sensors, uh, both the sonic and the um, gas analyzer, are generally uh, too large to uh, measure this type of eddies, especially for analyzers which have slightly larger uh, measurement path, like, uh, for example, uh, open path uh, like or 7700 for uh, measuring uh, methane. So at the end, sensors should be at least two meters, uh, should be placed at least two meters uh, above the ground surface, independent of the, uh, on the canopy height. So this was the description of the uh, picture on the left. Now we move to the picture on the right side. Uh, here we locate the system above the forest uh, and the standard twice the canopy height distance. You may have uh, to consider this if you have a smaller um, available fetch, uh, if you are in the upper portion uh, roughness sublayer. Uh, so some of the irre uh, irre uh, irregularities and uh, the fluxes may be uh, correctable and they are easy to uh, discard when we, uh, for example, flag uh, the data during data processing. Uh, so if you have smoother canopy, for example, um, then you may uh, not correct or lose much of data. So another important 
point to consider is when you are making uh, research in the fast growing uh, field like corn, for example, uh, you may consider to rise your Edicomarians tower uh, together with uh, growing corn. This would be mm, uh, the best and uh, the best approach. I don't have personal experience with that, but uh, this is uh, this is the best experience recommended. So um, mm, now um, is the question also, uh, we need to know what is important to consider to, to conduct eddy covariance uh, measurements, for example. So uh, the most important aspect um, is that the measurements from the footprint uh, represents only ecosystem of interest. So to investigate this, uh, we will look at the picture from uh, our ICO station uh, located in the southern uh, part of uh, Czech Republic. It's a mixed uh, broadleaf forest with the agricultural fields and some grasslands um, in the distance from the tower. So if the tower will be located um, uh, in the center with the, is marked here on the picture with the uh, red, uh, sorry, with the pink uh, color, uh, then the three uh, green circles uh, are fine. Uh, so we are still within uh, the um, area of interest with, uh, within the same um, homogeneous uh, forest. The, green, uh, the yellow circle is already at the edge because we can see that includes already some uh, grasslands. And the uh, red circle, uh, of course, includes the agricultural fields and grasslands already. So this area already should be uh, excluded. We don't want to have um, unwanted fluxes, so uh, we should uh, exclude this area. But uh, how uh, big fetch then uh, should be? So th this distance, um, the fetch is going to be approximately 100 times um, the height H1 in this case, above the zero plane displacement line. This means that the higher H1 uh, is the farther out the fetch uh, could possibly be. And here is the uh, one dimensional graph that allows us to visualize the footprint. Uh, you can notice it's not the straight line, uh, but the curve that represents uh, the contribution to the flux measurements at different distances from the tower. And uh, the darker red color, the, the larger the contribution, and you can use uh, the most of the contribution um, is, so you can see that the most of the contribution is uh, from the, uh, not from the closest, not from the farthest, but somehow in, uh, somehow in between, so between like 50, 100 uh, meters from the tower. There are numbers uh, of um, different footprint models uh, which you can use. Uh, they are cited in the literature, but uh, mostly uh, they are like Klune or Korman Meixner, Sweb et al. So um, you can you can find them in the literature. And now we will go to the experimental design. Uh, what is important to remember about this? So. Uh, we will start to talk about the purposes of our research uh, actually even before we start buying the instruments. So this is how it should be uh, because uh, what we want to measure will drive also what variables we will need to collect and finally what hardware we will uh, need to buy. When we will plan to buy hardware also, we need to then think about the instruments uh, requirements for conducting adequate variance measurements. Uh, we talk about this late, uh, earlier already. So we need, uh, as mentioned before, sonic uh, anemometer and gas analyzers mainly, but of course uh, there is this uh, interface unit as mentioned and so on. So already summarize uh, the main principles of uh, any covariance measurements. Uh, measurements at the point uh, are assumed to represent an upwind area. Measurements are assumed to be done uh, to be done inside the boundary layer. Um, then this is uh, very important to conduct them in the constant flux layer. Uh, fetch and put, footprint are assumed uh, adequate, uh, so the flux is measured only from the area of interest. Um, flux is fully turbulent, uh, terrain ideally should be flat and homogeneous. Of course, they are now um, developing uh, the concepts and uh, approaches how to uh, conduct measurements, adequate variance measurements on the slopey terrain or uh, in the urban areas. Those are the already uh, big um, group, big communities uh, working in this topic, if you are interested. Um, um, 
we were just talking here uh, mostly about the ideal conditions for the eddy covariance uh, measurements and very basic um, uh, principles. So we assume that density fluctuations are negligible. Uh, also, we assume that flow divergences and convergences are uh, negligible and the instruments uh, can detect very small changes because they are uh, working with very high um, frequency, like 20 uh, times per second. And with this slide, I would like to thank you very much uh, for your attention. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, and we appreciate your time and the presentation. Uh, so we would like to uh, give room for some more questions. I don't know if you would um, want to respond directly to the question uh, that was asked earlier on, maybe just to let the person feel the question has been answered. Yeah. Okay. So the question was... Um, so for young scientists who are willing to install and manage the eddy covariance tower, how do they identify if there is flow distortion, that's flow disturbance by the tower structure? Uh, well, we need to before do the calculations uh, of the wind roses, for example, to know uh, from which direction the uh, wind is coming. And then we will know um, which if the tower is the, is the physical obstacle uh, to um, which have to be, let's say, <laughs> removed uh, or not removed, but it has to be um, uh, correctly um, mounted, let's say. So uh, those, are, and those are the main uh, approaches at the very, very beginning. Uh, so you are not uh, installing first all instruments and then checking your data. Uh, only at the very beginning, you are um, you see you are checking with the sonic anemometer, for example, what is the uh, wind direction, what is the wind roses, and then uh, so it means uh, to know from where it's the mean uh, uh, the main wind direction coming, and then uh, you are setting the the instruments accordingly. Okay, so there is also another question. Um, the person will want to know from your from your research experience. Um, can you talk a bit more about the open versus the closed path analysis uh, and then gas analysis and possibly which uh, what each one means and um, and in which yeah. cases would we use each one of them? Maybe all the advantages or the or the disadvantages of each one of them. Yeah. Well, um, from my experience, uh, I would recommend the open path uh, and I will start already directly like that, but uh, not always in my uh, so far career, it was possible. So I was starting with the closed path uh, gas analyzer, uh, Los Gatos for measuring methane, for example. And it required uh, quite a lot of uh, work with the pump, with uh, um, building the whole instrumentation, uh, with the power consumption, for example, uh, because of the pump, for example, uh, which needs a lot of uh, power. And uh, nowadays, um, in the um, Global Change Research Institute, where we work uh, together with colleagues, uh, we have also open path, but also closed path um, aerodyne quantum cascade laser uh, for the methane measurements. And there, um, it's also a lot of uh, additional, um, not only work, it's not only about work, but also about the maintenance of the instrument, um, also about the power consumption. So for the places which are somewhere remotely uh, located, uh, for sure, this is not an advantage. Uh, at the, for the beginners, if someone would like to start with eddy covariance and has such a possibility to choose the place um, uh, to, or this has to be actually, choosing the place has to be the right one, but um, if there is possibility to to have the ideal conditions, this is the the best for the beginners. Okay. However, uh, now when I'm thinking, also um, some difficult side can be also nice because we are always uh, um, learning from any challenges. What about if the place is uh, dry, relatively dry and dusty? Possibly, which one uh, of them would yeah. Um, 
for the dusty in case of, for example, open path, then it's uh, needed also regular maintenance and cleaning the, the windows there. Uh, for the dusty in case of, for example, um, uh, the closed path, uh, then the filters needs to be changed regularly. So um, in harsh conditions, uh, both systems need to be uh, maintained and regularly uh, checked up. Of course, this is not the everyday, but um, then you are controlling uh, different parameters, uh, which can help you to, um, to, to tell uh, if you have, for example, some remote uh, access to the, to the instrumentation, uh, which are able to tell you um, that something is wrong happening with the instruments, like, for example, pressure is, pressure is drop, dropping down or so, and, uh, or flow is not the, the, the right one. So things like that. It depends on the um, specific instrumentation, of course, uh, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we are still we still have some more time. So um, please, if you have questions, you can um, either try to uh, put a hand up, or you can just type it, key it in the chat session, so that um, Natalia can do justice to it. Just in case, also you can write me an email. Uh, if you don't have questions now, uh, we can uh, you can write me an email. Um, yeah. Okay. So and um, as well later. And I just want to quickly um, remind everybody that we also have the Slack channel. I have just posted the uh, link to the Slack channel in the chat, so it's. Um, and you, we can all join that Slack channel, including um, Natalia and Giraldo, and, and keep the conversation going for um, a couple more days up to the end of, of the workshop period. Um, the presenters for tomorrow and Wednesday will also be joining this channel. So um, I will encourage everybody to um, join the channel and and post any um, additional comments or questions that you have. And, and then we can um, continue to interact with each other um, on Slack beyond um, this Zoom meeting. Okay, so we are still, um, if you have any question that you need immediate response, she's okay. So now readily available to also answer that. And um, maybe, maybe whilst we wait for, for any questions, I just want to remind you that tomorrow, again, we have um, another session starting at 10 um, UTC to 12 o'clock. And um, yes, uh, there's a question about the meetings are recorded and the recordings will be made available on our website, um, which we will share with all of you as, as participants. So. Yes, everything is being recorded and it will be it will be made available uh, later on. So tomorrow we have um, Ladislav um, speaking to us about um, processing eddy covariance data. And uh, on, on um, Wednesday, we have Pascal um, Bus um, sharing his experience with um, site management and, and site installation um, with a specific focus on, on the work that he's done in the um, Congo Basin. So installing um, a flux um, tower in the Congo and making some measurements. So he would, he would use that to um, explain to us how you can actually set up and run your own um, flux tower. So um, we hope to see you all again tomorrow and also on Wednesday. Okay, so there's another question. Okay, so there's another question. Um, for PhD students, is it possible to receive a certificate of participation with credits? Hello. Yeah, so there's another question. Uh, for PhD students, is it possible to receive a certificate of participation with credits? Um, we don't actually have certificates for these workshops. Um, I think we've, we've received a number of questions about this, so going forward, we will, we will plan to have something like that. But if you need us to sign off a document or something that says you have attended this workshop, we'll be happy to do that. Um, we'll be happy to sign a document to say that you attended this workshop over this three-day period. 
um, and, and that'll be, we'll be happy to do that for you. Okay, so I think, uh, okay. So I think um, there are, in the absence, okay, there's another question. Okay, so can you, uh, to Natalia and, uh, can you recommend some papers uh, to learn about the spectra or co-spectral analysis? First, I would recommend the main book of eddy covariance uh, for sure for the beginners. Uh, first, this is Burba book, of course, but also that's really, really nicely written for the beginners. And later, uh, already more advanced is um, Dario Papale and Aubinet um, eddy covariance guide. And there is uh, a lot of um, topics, but also at the end of each main topic it's a set of uh, literature uh, also about the cost spectra and uh, spectra analysis so a lot of uh, but mainly i would recommend this book okay all right so um i think in the absence of any further questions we would like to thank um, our speakers gerardo and natalia for the great work, for the great presentation. We have really been enlightened and uh, keep on with the good work that you're doing. And we will also meet you on the Slack channel. And I'm sure that will also be more interactive. We will try to keep it very interactive. And then we also want to also thank other scientists who also joined. We, I know um, there is a Georg uh, who also, managed to assist us with even answering some of the questions on the chat page. We appreciate that a lot. And then um, to everyone, to, to the participants and everyone, and to also my, to the co-host uh, Fred for all the fantastic job done. So we hope to meet you tomorrow, same time, um, 10 to 12 UTC. And uh, we hope to also have another wonderful presentation by Ladia. Okay, so thank you all and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye. See you tomorrow. See you. Okay. okay. Yay. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm ending it. It will so it will save the.